Hey miners, welcome or welcome back to the channel McNally Money, the new home of power mining analysis. In today's episode, Anthony Power and I are thrilled to welcome Dennis Porter to the program. He's an OG in the Bitcoin space. He also happens to be the co-founder and CEO of Satoshi Action Fund. This is a team that's really focused on policy and education surrounding Bitcoin. We've got a lot to talk about in today's video, but before we do, please take a second, hit the like button for us, you guys. Big help to myself and the channel. If you're not already subscribed, McNally Money, feel free to join. And let us know in the comment section below if you've heard of Dennis's work, what you think about Satoshi Action Fund, their mission and their organization, and your outlook in terms of Bitcoin adoption over the next few years. Now with that being said, let's get into today's interview. Okay guys, so that's right. Today's video, a very special guest, one of the OGs in the Bitcoin space. We've got Dennis Porter. He's the co-founder and CEO of Satoshi Action Fund. A very timely interview here with all of the political developments going on in the United States. This team is really focused on supporting policy and education, as we'll talk about in today's presentation. But Dennis, uh, both Anthony and I are huge fans of you and really looking forward to this discussion. Yeah, same. Thank you for having me on, McNally. And uh, uh, Anthony, also great to see you. Uh, always been a big fan of your work ever since you got started and um, happy to be here chatting with you today. Thanks very much, Dennis. And and, and going back to our early, earlier time, we, we, we sort of like discussed things over Zoom calls initially, but this year we've managed to meet a couple of times. I think once in Bedford at the Chico conference and then obviously at the Nashville conference, we saw you there in uh, doing your thing in Nashville. So, you know, great, great to get you on the podcast and to, to really explain. But let's go back to before the sort of like the Bitcoin. What, tell us about your your background, you know, in the early days, what 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 you did before you got into sort of Bitcoin itself and then how you, how you, progress into Bitcoin? What what was your orange pill moment? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I originally discovered Bitcoin in 2017. And I stayed, you know, very quiet for a long time. And up until about 2020, when I started to get much more vocal. But when I found Bitcoin, I was very attracted to this idea that people could access the technology uh, without being discriminated against and that people could be banked by this technology that are currently unbanked. You know, the unbanked in the world is r roughly 2 billion people. And those 2 billion people, you know, they're amongst them, there could be the next Einstein, there could be the next great creator, uh, the next great inventor, uh, the next great poet, but we'll never know, we'll never experience their talents and their skills because they simply never had the ability to buy their first textbook or their car to get to school or to be able to afford their first house so they could create a stable life for themselves. So there are 2 billion people that are rotating on and off this planet on a yearly basis. You know, you're cycling through all these 2 billion people that their lives just really don't come to full fruition. And it's really a sad and unfortunate thing that the world has to miss out on all the potential that these 2 billion people have to offer. And so I think Bitcoin provides a lifeline and an opportunity for those people that are most uh, left outside the system, uh, the people that are traditionally marginalized and excluded from the financial system. And so that was why I originally really fell in love with Bitcoin. I have since gone on to love so much more about the technology, especially the components of the Bitcoin mining industry. Uh, but in 2020, 2021 is when I started to get really loud. I, you know, I, I learned about Bitcoin. This is a note to people. I always say, you know, learn about Bitcoin in silence for at least a few years uh, and then start talking about it because you'll run through a lot of bad opinions about Bitcoin pretty quickly, but at least you did it in silence. Uh, and it's not a public record out there, you know, with your tweets saying things that uh, obviously probably weren't really uh, good things to say back in the day. Uh, and so I think that there was a lot of value in learning about Bitcoin in silence for four or five years, and then eventually getting super vocal about it in 2020, and especially vocal about it in 2021, where I started to tell people that they really should look at Bitcoin as something that needs political activity, activity and people need to become politically engaged around Bitcoin to be able to make sure that our country can be successful and the world can be successful with this technology. You know, I tell people it's a lot like the internet, right? You can, you know, in the early days, people thought it was for uh, scammers, that it was for 
uh, you know, crime or criminals or drug trade. And eventually people came to learn that the internet was so much more than that. I mean, even this video call that we're on right now, right, was like nobody would have ever thought this would have been possible to have HD video calls uh, where you're talking to each other and record it. And then the next, what are you guys saying? Two hours later, you're going to like put it out on the internet for everyone else to watch. So that's some incredible things that are made possible by the internet. And I think we're in that same early stages with Bitcoin. And so I try to work really hard to make sure people understand the value of this technology. And part of that is going to lawmakers and regulators. And then we need to educate them on the value of it. Otherwise, they're going to regulate it in a way that they don't, they think, you know, what is the point of this technology? What is the value of it? And then laws and regulations are written with, I think, a short-sighted viewpoint on what the technology is capable of. And so at Satoshi Action, uh, which launched in June of 2022, after I I screamed into the void about the need to become politically active. I decided to launch my own organization alongside my two co-founders and got to work educating lawmakers and regulators on the benefits of the technology and then eventually went on to pass, you know, four bills into law and produce peer-reviewed research and a number of different other things. But uh, yeah, very excited about the work that we've been able to accomplish in the last uh, couple of years. And there are even bigger things around the horizon. So excited to get into all of that with you. Just just before we get on to the, the, the Satoshi Fund is... Going back, I, I did hear on a recent Spaces meeting that actually going back three or four years ago, you were one of the like OGs in terms of the Spaces meetings with the likes of Mike Alfred <laughs> yeah. setting up and, and them discussions. I, I probably at that point wasn't listening to Spaces meetings. I've only really got into that that part in the last maybe 12 months. But can you sort of like give us an idea of some of the some of the topics that you were discussing in those early days? Of space meeting and sort of what type, what size of audiences we are getting comparable to some of the ones that we see today. Yeah, it, it was a fun, fun time. It was me, Mike, Alfred, and uh, an Anon uh, named Logscale. We are having such a great time. What ha what happened was, so I jumped online to start talking about Bitcoin, and I quickly came across Clubhouse. I don't know if anyone here remembers Clubhouse. Yeah. Right in the yeah. middle of the shutdowns, it was like. It was invite all the only. Invite only. Yeah, Clubhouse. yeah. For a while, it was invite only. Yeah, that's exactly right. Eventually, they opened it up to the broader ecosystem. But yeah, for a while, it was invite only, and everyone was going on there. I actually built like a very, very cool audience on Clubhouse. I was, I had my own. What did they call them? Clubs? I think they were just clubs you had, and and I had like one of the high, the largest clubs in the entire Bitcoin space. And I started doing regular shows like pod, I, you know, on spaces, I'll have panels and all that. Like I kind of, to a degree, like became very popular for doing that. I wouldn't say I was the first one to do it on Clubhouse, but definitely in the Bitcoin ecosystem, I was near the, near the front of the line uh, when it came to putting on these rooms that are like, I would say more so content and less so, oh, let's just get in a room and talk, which I loved those too. But people were sort of desiring something a little bit more than just a room with, you know, Bitcoiners in it. So I started doing all these panels and all this content got really popular there. But then I saw Twitter was launching Twitter Spaces. And I thought to myself, I've seen this game before. I've seen this show before where like an app sort of absorbs another app as just like a feature. And the new app, the app that like adds the the feature, like crushes the old one. I mean, the good, good example here is when Facebook, excuse me, Facebook, which owns Instagram, Instagram, decided to basically copy Snapchat with stories. And, you know, the next day, Snapchat was like gone. Like it did, nobody cared about Snapchat anymore. So I predicted the same exact thing would happen with Twitter Spaces and Clubhouse. It, I ended up being right on that. But when I moved over, everyone was like, what are you doing? Why are you leaving us? And uh, also Twitter Spaces was super glitchy. So people were like, this technology sucks. Like, we, you know, we don't want to use that technology. But I, you know, gutted it out. Uh, despite the technology being very, very uh, primitive in its early days. And during those days, I mean, you'd would, you would still get the same, not roughly the same numbers as you do today, 500, 1,000, mm -hmm. 2,000, 5,000. You wouldn't see any of these mega rooms that they have now, but uh, the numbers were really good. And it would be like me, Mike, and, you know, this log scale guy. And it was crazy because you'd have like, you'd be the only spaces on. Like now it's like you could barely find the spaces when yeah. you're going on. But back then it was like the only one. And so everyone would jump on and because they wanted to hear us again, they'd have to follow us because now it's like you, the algorithm like kind of figures out how to show you every single spaces that ever existed. Back then you had to follow the person to have access to their spaces or to see them. And so 
the followers were just like, it was crazy. We went from like 20,000 to 50,000 to 70,000 followers in just like a matter of months. And so now it's like you could go on a spaces with 10,000 people and maybe you gain like five followers, right? So uh, yeah, it was, it was early days. It was a lot of fun. And eventually that converted into me launching my own podcast. And then the podcast uh, ended up in me, sort of led to me talking a lot about politics. And then of course the politics, talking about politics led to me going into politics myself, I guess, so, so to speak. There you go. Well, a uh, true visionary on all aspects. And you really blazed the trail that people like myself and Anthony are now following in your footsteps, right? And trying to support that ecosystem, create that content. And it's funny listening uh, to your orange pill moment, Dennis, because uh, we heard at the conference, you've never met an ex-Bitcoiner, right? There's a lot of people that are scared to get involved. There's a lot of people that are are against it to start. But once people put in that time, that research that you talked about, I've Definitely. never met anyone who said, hey, I was super into Bitcoin, but now I'm not anymore. Uh, so it's interesting. Nobody goes the other way. Now, you talk about Satoshi Action Fund, some of the bills and laws that you've uh, implemented and supported. So for people who are maybe unfamiliar with even what Satoshi Action Fund is, can you give us some examples of the work you've done and why it matters to the Bitcoin community? Yeah, absolutely. But first, I just want to go back. You, you said a comment, you know, you said I'm a, I'm a trailblazer, maybe a little bit, but there, there's certainly uh, countless amounts of trailblazers that have come before me laying groundwork, uh, whether that be just building the Bitcoin protocol to, you know, on social media to uh, the political space. You know, certainly I think I was pretty far out in, in advance on the political stuff, but even there's people that were even around doing stuff back then. So I think we just need to, to acknowledge that there are a lot of different trailblazers, a, a countless amount of trailblazers in the Bitcoin space, which is also part of the reason I love it. There's so much room to to blaze a trail. There's so much room to innovate and to create. And uh, I, I, I sort of uh, think of Bitcoin as the next frontier, so to speak. So lots of opportunity there. With regards to Satoshi Action. So Satoshi Action, it's a nonprofit uh, and what we do is we educate lawmakers and regulators on the benefits of the technology. And then we also turn around and we say, okay, now that you like this technology, now that you love Bitcoin as much as I do, here is a bill that you can introduce that will help to protect the rights of Bitcoiners and help to grow Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining in your state's jurisdiction. Uh, there are a couple of benefits for that approach. Uh, people might ask why we're going to the states, especially for a non-US audience or international audience. Uh, in the United States, the states have a lot of sovereignty compared to other parts of the world where it's like the federal government is basically God. Like in the United States, the states themselves actually have quite a bit of power. Uh, everything from the dual banking system where states have the right to create their own banks uh, to the ability to uh, right today, there's states that are legalized cannabis and it's a federal law banning cannabis. So you see this pretty common I think what would be considered to be like uh, almost like a conflict. So a lot of times they work together, but sometimes there's conflict over policy and there's not always a clear line on like whose law we should be following, right? Like is, is the state have sovereignty? Does the federal government have sovereignty? There's a lot of conversations around, you know, should I think we approach from the state level. And I always tell people that these are the two reasons why. One is because you can create a bulwark of states that protect the right to access Bitcoin. So very much like the cannabis industry, how they started in Washington and they started in Colorado legalizing cannabis. All of a sudden, boom, you had these two states where people knew they could go there and that they could participate in the cannabis industry and ecosystem and they would be safe. Uh, now, the cannabis industry has gone on to pass bills in almost 75 percent of the country to legalize cannabis in, a, in one degree or another. And that that giant bulwark of states, uh, that wave of states is now applying pressure on the federal government because the federal government is like, wow, now, I mean, we got all these states. They're all pro cannabis. They all want to see cannabis happen. We got to do something. We got to like move the same direction as them. So in some ways you're creating that safe haven, but also once the safe haven gets big enough, then the federal government is like, oh gosh, well, these states have all decided. So we better start going that direction with them as well. So you can create that pressure. So Almost a I, you grassroots know, approach, eh? Grassroots. That's exactly right. Yeah. Absolutely, totally grassroots and bottom up. And and in a way, I wouldn't say nobody can stop you, 
But as long as you make a compelling argument for why these states should adopt Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining, and maybe other there are other components of the digital asset ecosystem as well. Uh, but I just so your audience knows, I'm very focused on Bitcoin. But there's you got to go in and give a compelling argument. There's jobs. There's grid balancing from mining. There is the ability to mitigate methane emissions. There's a savings technology. There is the ability for your people in your jurisdiction to access financial tools without discrimination. These are all things that lawmakers already know they want and need in their jurisdiction. So when you come in and you say Bitcoin is a solution to help you achieve the problems that you've always known and have existed, it's not hard for them to go, okay, this sounds like a good idea. Like, now tell me more. And this is where we start to jump in with peer-reviewed research and say, we have academic science-backed peer-reviewed research that shows the claims we're making are true. Because although we all love to listen to podcasts and listen to the people in this space who are very intelligent, sometimes more intelligent than the academics, uh, the, the lawmakers and the regulators don't trust the podcasters. They trust the system in the process. And oftentimes the system in the process involves taking certain steps. And that step oftentimes is peer reviewed research, which helps to back up with credible evidence backed research uh, that the claims that we make on our podcasts like this one are actually true. Um, additionally, also passing the bill in other states is helpful. They'll go, oh, well, has anybody else done this? I don't want to be the first one out there. Luckily, we already have four states that have passed our bills into law. And so we've created this track record. We've created this blueprint for folks so that they can see that there is a ton of value and also demand for the policy that we're trying to pass into law. Just, I mean, it's, that, it's really interesting. I mean, you've got four bills passed already. I'm assuming as you go from state to state, um, the fact that you're doing this again and again, you're the 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 way you're presenting, um, you know, you're able to sort of I, I can I, I'd like to sort of see your first presentation to the first state and how you're delivering it now as a team, with obviously having more and more information available as you as you've grown the fund and 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 grown. The, the, the team around you, um, it must be a very professional, um, you know, polished p a piece now that you're delivering in terms of where you were at the, maybe at the start. And the fact that you've had states fall in line, does it become a slightly bit easier as you go along to sort of look at, or do you find challenges yeah. in every state that you go to and you've got to start from the beginning again? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. Yes, there is always challenges and new challenges that we face every day and you know once you become bigger you get attacked more and people sort of try to take you down and take you down a notch uh even in your own industry you can see that happen oh, yes. but generally speaking things are getting easier and we are able to get more done and in fact our our approach sort of is becoming more expansive and like what we're asking for is growing. So instead of just saying, okay, for instance, when we passed our first bill into law, that was a right to mine bill and we passed it into law in Arkansas. And then we passed it just quickly after in Montana, that bill particularly focuses on Bitcoin mining, as you might imagine, considering it's called the right to mine. Uh, it does a number of different things. I won't get into the nitty gritty here, but ultimately it just helps to ensure that Bitcoin mining can be successful in those states. The next year when we came back, you know, we had a couple of thoughts. One was, okay, we've pissed, passed two bills into law so people can see that we know what we're doing, we know what we're talking about, and they're going to trust us more and see that we know what we're doing. Passing one bill into law is not easy, let alone two in multiple jurisdictions in our first year. Uh, the second big thing that we were thinking about was, okay, when we passed these two bills into law, FTX was collapsing, the market was a mess, everything is falling apart, but we're clearly headed towards another traditional bull run. So let's grow this bill a little bit and let's add something to it. Uh, we added things like the right to self-custody. Uh, we added things like the right to run a node. We also have protections in there for peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And we're going to expand on that as even further as we go on. But what that did was, it added difficulty, right? Because we could have just said, oh, let's just pass this bill we've already passed. And like, we can just, no problem, right? We can just get it done. And by adding new components to the bill, we increased sort of the complexity and the difficulty of getting it passed. So even though theoretically from year one to year two, our job is easier, we were not willing to just accept what was the easy win. And we went for a, something with a little bit more ambition and we'll continue to do that, you know? And then of course, I think this last year we learned this last cycle, I should say. So 
first cycle 2023, second cycle 2024, our third cycle will be 2025. And those cycles mean that the states all generally start their legislative sessions at the exact same time, which is January through roughly uh, June. And everybody is either like a month long, which is insane. Some are just literally 30 days uh, to 60 days to, you know, three or four months long. And that's about 95% of the states. So it's like you're gunning, you're moving right away, January through that period of time. Uh, and so on our second cycle, though, when we came in to have these conversations, we started introducing all this new these new components, and that did increase the difficulty. But as we go forward in our third cycle, we learned a lot in the second cycle, I think even more than we did in the first cycle, because we had our bills in so many states. This is the craziest part, was the demand and the interest like skyrocketed. We went from introducing nine bills in seven states in 2023 that passed two bills into law so far, or in 2023, we passed two bills into law, to in 2024, we introduced over, what is it, got to be like 25 pieces of legislation in 20 states. So it was this huge explosion. In fact, it was just almost too much to an extent. And along that way, we, we learned a lot. And so we're going to be making some changes with the legislation. We haven't really, I think, became super public about it, but there is some things that we're going to adjust. And I think we might even create multiple pieces of legislation based off of our core legislation because passing everything in one bill it can be difficult because it creates multiple problems in one bill versus sort of like separating those problems out. So that should be interesting change as we go forward. I think people will really be interested in watching how those bills perform as separate pieces of legislation. Yeah, that's great. Hey, now, Dennis, uh, speaking of cycles, another thing we have on the horizon here is the election cycle. So keeping in mind, you've got a Brit and a Canadian on the call with you, uh, not voting in the US this, this year. Obviously, Bitcoin has become a major platform uh, speaking point. We were both in Nashville, as were, were yourself, saw RFK's speech, saw former President Trump's speech, Obviously, a lot of people vote with their wallets. This is becoming a real issue for people that hold crypto or Bitcoin. Uh, how uh, how do you see this election playing out and the role of Bitcoin in terms of uh, the general public's kind of voting decision? Well, I'm I'm glad you're not voting in the U.S. Uh, that could be a that could be a little bit a little bit problematic. So, um, thank you for clarifying for the audience. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, U.S. elections coming up. It, Definitely going to be an interesting time. I think Bitcoin is very much on the ballot uh, more than ever this year. Last like, last uh, election, 2022, there were certainly some races that people had interest in, but the degree of interest has exploded exponentially in this um, election cycle, 2024. That's typical in a presidential election cycle. So last time was the midterms where there's no presidential election. It's just um, some House and Senate members that are going to be voted on. Well, the whole the whole House, I should say, and then some Senate members. The whole House gets voted on every two years. And so that's every single election cycle. And then the Senate for those, this is for the international audience, of course, the Senate is every six years, someone gets elected. So every two years, I think it's every two years, a third of the Senate gets replaced. Uh, but then on, of course, the every four years, you have the presidential election on top of all of that, which is critical because presidential elections drive a lot of turnout. And so whoever's leading that ticket either can do a lot of good or a lot of bad for the down ballot. You'll hear a lot of people talk about down ballot in the United States. And if you have a really good sort of like Obama-esque like figure who who's like getting everyone excited and you're like going out in droves to vote, that type of candidate can in, can help down ballot, you know, on his side of the aisle, down ballot Democrats win a lot, right? Um, we have probably not really experienced a superior down ballot presidential candidate since Obama. Um, you know, some people would might put uh, Trump into that category, although Trump has sort of like a divisive, he's very divisive in the sense that like, there's a lot of people that don't like Trump. Um, and there's a whole wave of people that would try to vote against him just because he's on the ballot, so to speak. So I really, I don't think you've really seen a, a strong down ballot candidate since uh, Obama. I think the Democrats are kind of hoping that that Kamala Harris can do the same. I think obviously TB TBD, right? We'll see what's going on, but she did raise half a billion dollars within four weeks, five weeks of launching her campaign, which is a uh, earth shattering, record shattering number. So this is going to be a very, in my opinion, uh, really, really close election. You're going to have 
uh, Trump and Kamala fighting tooth and nail for every vote. I mean, Trump is clearly very good at running for office. Like he is just a very savvy uh, politician, so to speak. I think bringing RFK on to his ticket, so to speak, is like it just you know, whether you like him or you don't like him, Trump, or whether you like him or you don't like RFK, the Kennedy name just carries a lot of weight. And and I think that it's going to result in a significant boost for him and, and his campaign. And now you have, I think, RFK being the most pro-Bitcoin candidate in this cycle, joining the Trump campaign, which is the second most pro-Bitcoin campaign this cycle you know, bodes well for the, for them securing that Bitcoin vote. Now there's of course, a lot of people working overtime to encourage the Kamala Harris campaign to take a look at crypto and Bitcoin broadly and do, to do somewhat of a reset. There's, there's a lot of talk of a reset. It's very clear that there is a reset effort underway. And there is also reset interest uh, at, in the Harris campaign, because we have seen comments from senior staff saying, you know, that they're interested in encouraging policy that would encourage the growth of the sector here in the United States. Now, that's not even close to where the Republicans are, right? The Republicans are like putting it in their party platform. Trump is saying he's going to protect Bitcoin. You know, he's going to fire Gary Gensler. These are much more, much stronger statements. But it is good to see that really, I would say, like somewhat the Overton window has shifted. If you would have told people four years ago that, you know, presidential candidates are battling over Bitcoin voters, like they would have thought that you're crazy. Uh, but yet that's where we are. And I think there's a there's a number of different factors why. But, the you know, one of the biggest ones is that this is a whole new voter class and that, you know, political parties and political campaigns, they are always trying to identify and and, um, and to identify and secure new voter classes, new voter groups. And the Bitcoin voter group is totally, even the crypto voter group is totally on its own and it has its own set of issues and has been attacked, you know, pretty, pretty extensively by federal regulators this last, you know, four years, whether that be the SEC or whether that be the banking regulators, the FDIC, um, the Fed, and also uh, the OCC. So there's this huge problem that there's this huge pain point that has been created for crypto broadly. Uh, through federal regulators. And now I think voters want to come in and see that problem solved. Now you have other things like, you know, Free Ross and all this other, uh, these other po policy positions that people care about. But really, it's I think those federal regulators that are people are having the biggest issue with. And so Trump is coming in saying he's going to solve that problem. That really, really bodes well for his campaign. And that's why he's seen mass amounts of donations come his way. And I, this will brings me to my second reason why I think this voter class is so important, because not only are they deeply entrenched and have a lot of issues they, that directly impact them, they're willing to spend growing numbers, amounts of money. In fact, there's a recent report that came out that said that the crypto uh, corporations accounted for almost 50% of all super PAC money. That is an insane, insane number. They're beating out uh, the military, they're beating out uh, pro, you know, religious nonprofit groups. They're beating out the Koch brothers. The Koch brothers, I don't, for, for, the, for the two of you that don't know, or the international audience that might not know, the Koch brothers are like, they're considered to be like the biggest spenders in politics for forever. And they have dominated politics for the last decade. And so for, and so for crypto to come in and pour this much money, in fact, I think I saw some number that was like, they not only are they winning in this election cycle, but in the last 10 years, they're almost they're number two in the last 10 years. And they're they're on pace to beat everyone out and be the number one in the last 10 years of the amount of money spent in super PACs, which, listen, I'm no fan of big money in politics. I think that there is certainly a, a problem that we have identified in our country that doesn't seem to want to go away, which is that you can spend billions of dollars in elections and you can have you know, massive amounts of money be dumped into elections. And there's really, I think, a, a crowding out of the public's voice. That's something that I used to fight for and uh, it's sort of a losing battle at this point. But uh, needless to say, if you want to win an election, you know, there are a lot of voters and there's a lot of money that is really interested in seeing pro Bitcoin, pro crypto candidates get elected. And so I think that's why politicians need to be taking an even closer eye as they move forward. Otherwise, they risk, you know, having someone else come in and swoop up this new audience. It's it's interesting um, going back to to Nashville and 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 I didn't get to see all the presentations on the main stage, but I made sure I saw the RFK presentation. I saw the Trump presentation, um, and you could see from RFK's presentation. I think it, was, it came across as more passionate um, passionate speech in terms yeah. of 
he seemed to be a lot more familiar with with Bitcoin. He seemed to understand it. And in terms of the fact that, you know, when he I think he articulated he would put quite a high percentage of his wealth into Bitcoin. That for me was like, well, there's somebody that's wholly behind wholly behind, behind Bitcoin. But can you sort of like give us a, a sort of like an understanding of, of you know, the, 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 the amount of people in America that do have, you know, effectively crypto of some sort in their in their wallets or in or help on on an exchange, for instance, um, just to give us an, an idea of how big this this is coming into this election. Yeah, I believe it's fifty two million Americans have engaged with crypto in some way or another. So, you know, obviously anybody that's engaged with the vast majority of the people that have engaged with crypto are probably voters or like eligible voters, I would say, because you you know in order to buy and hold crypto, you know, you have to have money. So you have to have a job and you probably have a bank account and all of these things generally don't start until you're 18 or roughly close to that age. So, and those are all, so that the vast majority of these people, although they skew younger, um, definitely younger for sure in the crypto space, they are, they're eligible voters. And I think elected officials, you know, if they want to win out that 52 million people who are not only, I think, very economically dependent on policy, because they own crypto or they own Bitcoin and the outcomes of policy directly impact their wallet. I think additionally, and this is what's going really under acknowledged in the parties and under acknowledged by the people on the left and the right is that th that crypto people, particularly Bitcoin people, feel a, a sense of uh, like ethical, moral need to protect Bitcoin because they feel that Bitcoin can solve so many of these problems like banking the unbanked. It can have a great impact on uh, reducing methane emissions. There's a lot of social value to Bitcoin, providing financial inclusivity to people across the globe, the 2 billion people that I talked about earlier. There's a, and that's just like the stuff that I, you know, top at my mind, because that's why I care about Bitcoin. There's a whole laundry list of reasons why people feel that Bitcoin is going to have a value-based impact, a social-based impact on America. And that's why they rise up. You know, of course, it makes it a lot easier to rise up when you know that you're protecting your own, you know, financial well-being. I think that's one of the most powerful incentives that we have in the world is like, is this going to be good for me financially? But on top of that, not only are you ensuring that your wealth is protected, you're you're sort of like making sure that you're doing a good to the world as well, which you typically getting, you know, protecting wealth and protecting social good usually don't go hand in hand, but Bitcoin does provide that opportunity. Yeah. And um, just 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 before we go on to the next topic, um, in terms of, and I heard a really good um, quote from from one of the Bitcoin miner CEOs in the fact that by going to Nashville and you know getting the opportunity to meet RFK Trump, it's not about the the fact that it's a Republican thing. It's about the conversation coming to 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 light for for, for you know effectively making the democrats force their hand then really to join the conversation and 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 then this it gives it gives people choice then because at the moment you know we're seeing obviously very positive side from the republicans on this and not as positive from from the democrats so it looks like um you know it's a very at the moment a very polarized view but i, th I think you've already articulated that things are maybe changing on the other side and that you know that's probably absolutely then people an opportunity to say actually we've got a choice now because you know, um, it's going to be, you know, equally looked at from both sides, uh, you know, in terms of where Bitcoin goes in the future. So where do you, so Dennis, where do you see the industry going, you know, from here, um, you know, in, in, in the, over the next few, few years now? So I wanted to go back to a point that you made, which is in alignment with where are we going? And you asked, you know, or you made a comment that, you know, Trump being pro Bitcoin seems to have had an impact on Democrats. I would say that certainly all political action has an impact and that when Trump supported or came out in favor of Bitcoin and crypto, and I think that everyone saw how much money he raised, it certainly made an impact. But I really want to stay away from saying that Democrats are becoming pro Bitcoin because of Trump. There have been hours, thousands of hours, dozens of pieces of peer-reviewed research. There have been uh, hundreds of meetings, maybe thousands of meetings, and there have been multiple political active, you know, politically active groups, including mine, including many in DC, 
there have been activists, there have been advocates, there's just, it's really hard to count just the amount of action that took place within those on the left, Democrats, progressives, liberals, to convince them that they should be pro-Bitcoin. Guys like Ro Khanna um, and others in the, you know, in the House of Representatives and in the Senate in Washington, D.C., have been at the forefront of this technology talking about why it matters and then you know sort of trump comes along and you know pokes it and it takes it to another you know t t sort of advances the conversation but by no means is you know the dem are the democrats sort of just solely reacting to trump i think that really poorly sort of creates a poor picture of you know all the work that all the advocates have done and the people that are doing things behind the scenes i know a number of them um, I don't know if they like to have their names said publicly about these things, so I won't do that. But there's so many of them. Um, I'm not even I'm just a small piece of that pie as well myself, too. So um, but where are we going to go from here? I think that we're going to go towards an environment where there is going to be an accelerated effort to adopt Bitcoin from a political perspective. I am seeing an entirely new wave of Democrats show very strong interest in the technology. I think that the industry is going to be put into a position where it's able to stick, you know, maintain itself as a bipartisan or nonpartisan issue, although it may not seem like that right now because of the election. Post-election, when things calm down, when people are off of their uh, their campaign trail and off of their soapboxes, there will be a, a need to come together for policy because in order to actually govern and run the country and get things done for Bitcoin, we need to come together as a country. We need to be able to unite around policy. And so I am looking forward to those conversations. I think, of course, it's going to start with a lot of market structure components, but then eventually we can get into the really interesting side of policy. Um, and, and I think that that's going to be a very positive thing because right now there really is no other real strong candidate for who is going to be the best country in the world for Bitcoin. And right now I think it is the United States, but we can do so, so much better. We're, we're just we're not even really scratching the surface at this point. We can do so much better with this technology, and that's going to start with good policy and creating a framework for how we can actually use this technology safely and effectively here in the United States. And I'll, I'll say really quickly because you know your international audience might be more uh, interested in policy and regulation. Oftentimes in the United States, there's an entire voter group, which of course, what which I was born into and raised by. Uh, that don't really see the need for any type of regulation. They don't see the need for any policy. You know, just let let people do what they want to do. I, I understand the ethos there. I understand the ethos of, you know, just let people be and leave them alone. But ultimately, we do need rules of the road. We need to have guidelines. And the reason why I'll give a quick example is when you drive on the freeway, there's a speed limit, right? And it's let's say it's 70 miles an hour because we're here in the United States. We're going to use miles per hour. And, you Why know, you <laughs> everybody probably, yeah, that's right. Everybody roughly drives, you know, probably 60, 70. They might go 80. You're not going to see too much higher. You're not going to see too much lower. And in fact, in the United States, in most places, you can get a ticket if you drive too slow. So, and not just too fast. And that's to make sure everyone's going the same speed. Because when you're driving on a freeway at high speeds, if you were to come around the corner on a freeway and someone's driving five miles an hour, like you could smash into the back of them. Very, it would be very, it's a very dangerous situation. So we create those rules of the road to create a more safe and effective way for people to drive from one place and to the other. And I think we need the same exact thing in the Bitcoin ecosystem. We just need clear rules of the road, enough to limit the bad behavior and, and create a super highway of good behavior so we can get to where we wanna go with Bitcoin. Yeah, that's such a great point and a, a very fitting close to the discussion here today, Dennis. I did want to give you the opportunity uh, to just give any final thoughts and where people could get uh, involved if if they're liking what they're hearing here. Maybe they live in the United States, they want to support the cause or get involved locally. Uh, what would be the next step or best step for them to take? Yeah, thank you. And, and thank you for having me on. Uh, best steps if you want to engage is you can go to our website. We have a number of different items you can click on uh, under our 
work page, you can see all of the things that we have done to support Bitcoin and the Bitcoin mining ecosystem. And then under the volunteer tab, you can click and sign up and be able to have your information there for us to tap into when we need volunteers. And then additionally, of course, if you find the work that we're doing is valuable, we would love to have the financial support. Our donors are our everything to us. Uh, without our donors, we get none of our work done. And so we're always looking for more people that want to get behind the work that we're doing. And uh, if anyone is really interested in supporting us in a big way, I'm always available for calls. You can uh, DM me on Twitter. I'm at Dennis underscore Porter underscore on Twitter. My DMs are always open and I'm always reading them. Sounds awesome. great. Yeah, I'll be sure to link all your socials and website in the video description below as well. Uh, Dennis, truly an honor. It's been great having you on the show today. We really appreciate your time, everything you're doing for the industry and supporting Bitcoin uh, and overall adoption of Bitcoin. So thank you so much. We look forward to having you back. You guys, if you're still watching at this point, hit the like button. Feel free to subscribe. If you have any additional questions, leave them in the comment section below and we'll see you back here tomorrow.